How do you measure worm castings quality? Well, there are four tests you should look for if you're trying to figure out if the castings you want to buy or maybe the castings you're making yourself are any good. We'll get to that on today's video. My name is Steve Churchill and this is the Urban Worm Company. I get calls and emails from people who want test results on our worm castings to verify their quality. And I also get questions from other worm castings producers on what they can do to verify the quality of the worm castings they're currently making themselves. Either way, there are four tests you should look for if you're really trying to nerd out on understanding how good your worm castings are. The most basic test of your worm castings is a standard compost test, which in the US anyways, you should be able to get from your local extension office or labs like a l Great Lakes or Midwest Labs. This is is the most basic test and it gives you the following information. It gives you moisture content which is measured as a percentage of the weight. You should see a number between 50 and 70 percent here. A number higher than 70 percent like this increases the risk of having an anaerobic vermicompost. Solid content. Again, this is measured as a percentage of the weight, and basically whatever's not gonna be moisture is gonna be a solid. Total nitrogen measured as a percentage, and this should be very low for worm casting, somewhere around 1%. As a side note, you're gonna notice that most commercially sold worm castings are gonna have an NPK value of around 100, meaning very low amounts of nitrogen and trace amounts of phosphorus and potassium. Now remember, we like worm castings because it has nutrient cycling microbes, not because of its nitrogen or other nutrients. A standard compost test is also going to give you pH, which should be neutral to slightly acidic, anywhere between 6 and 7. You're also going to get a measurement of salt content, which is going to be measured by a unit called DS over CM, which is a measure of electrical conductivity. I've seen it as low as 1.5 to 7 in the samples I've looked at, and worm castings can be somewhat high in salt, so this is probably something you want to look for. The test is going to show you organic matter measured as a percentage of weight. It's also going to give you the organic carbon, which is going to be roughly half of the organic matter percentage. And finally, it's going to give you a carbon to nitrogen ratio, which should be somewhere like 10 to 14 to 1. A higher number like 17 or something from this test indicates that maybe the vermicompost wasn't quite mature, because that number should decrease over time as the microbes consume the available carbon during the vermicomposting process. Some labs are also going to test for other nutrients or heavy metals or pathogens like E. coli. I have to say that I don't pour over test results that much, but if I'm looking at a standard compost test, I use it to find red flags, not whether or not I consider the castings to be quote unquote good or not. Now, what do I mean by that? I typically look at moisture content, pH, and carbon to nitrogen ratio. Moisture above 65 to 70% in screened vermicompost tells me the vermicompost is actually wetter and possibly anaerobic. A pH of below 5.5 is also a concern. It kind of tells me the vermicomposting feedstock was, is just simply too acidic, may not have had enough of that pH neutral bedding or things like agricultural lime to offset that uh, acidic material like food waste. Also, a carbon to nitrogen ratio of higher than 14 to 1 tells me that the vermicompost might have been harvested a little too early. Remember, that number should decrease to the 10 to 14 to 1 range to be considered mature. So the standard compost test gives me more clues about the composting or vermicomposting process than it does the product. We typically want to judge the product from its biology, though, and this is where a standard compost test falls short. What we need is a biological assessment, and you can get a good assessment from a soil trained expert in microscopy. Searching for a soil food web consultant near you would also work, although you could get this test through us here for the time being at the Urban Worm Company. Now these tests make a good effort to give you data, but what they do is take a small sample of soil, stick it in a solution, put it under a microscope at up to 400 times magnification in most cases. And based on what's observed in a single slide, or maybe three slides, the microscope nerds can make an assessment of the bacteria, the fungi, the nematodes, the protozoa, etc. in your worm castings. They can tell you if your castings are bacterial or fungal dominant, and some may even tell you if they're becoming more or less dominant over time, which is fascinating. And for each of the data points they give you, they sh should normally include a comment about your sample, whether this or that result is good, or if it indicates some sort of deficiency. And if I had to choose between one of the four tests I mentioned in this video, this is probably the one I'd look for. It's the test you probably want in order to get a basic understanding of the life in the soil. But at 400 times magnification, you can only see larger microbes like fungi and clusters of bacteria but you might have little to no idea of what type of bacteria or fungi you're looking at. So the next test you could get is an analysis of the microbiome using DNA sequencing. That's gonna drill down on your sample and really give you some detailed information. Now, this is pretty crazy and it's kind of a new way of assessing worm castings. This is like 23andMe, but for soil. And it's where things kind of get interesting. I became aware of this after a presentation by Dr. Zach Jones several
several years ago at the North Carolina State Permaculture Conference. He explained that due to advances in DNA sequencing, we can actually drill down on which class, order, family, genus, and species sometimes even species that are present in your vermicompost. Now, I'm gonna be upfront that a test like this is overkill for a home vermicomposter and likely overkill for most users of vermicompost except for the nerdiest of soil nerds. But it's interesting because some categories of bacteria or fungi perform certain tasks in our soil, whether it's plant growth regulation, pathogen suppression, or some other function. We don't know what the majority of these critters actually do, but soil scientists are finding out more and more of this stuff every day of what these things do in our soil. So the more we learn, the more useful these tests become. Also, a fancy graph like this showing your diversity doesn't mean much by itself. We already know that vermicompost tends to have an incredibly high level of diversity compared to other composts. The value of a DNA test for worm castings is understanding its level of diversity compared to other samples of worm castings. So if you get a test like this, ask the lab to assess your diversity compared to other samples they've received. I think the future is super interesting for this research. And when these labs collect samples, they're not just collecting the soil, they're also collecting information on how how it was made, like whether the vermicomposter used food waste or manure, whether it was made with continuous flow bins or just simple bins, where in the world it was made, how old it is, stuff like that. As scientists gather more and more samples, they can start to see patterns and make educated guesses about what certain vermicomposts are actually good for. Now, this is totally made up, but how awesome would it be to learn that vermicompost made from separated dairy solids helps suppress fungal disease better than vermicompost made from food waste? Or that food waste vermicompost made from banana waste tended to produce the fattest tomatoes. So I think the future of this research is really interesting. And if you can get your product tested like this, I would say go for it. And you can kind of add your sample to the body of research that's out there. But let's get real here. If you want the clearest proof of how well worm castings work, then you'd either want to conduct or pay someone else to conduct a field test of your worm castings. In a perfect world, you'd need to tightly control as many variables as possible. For instance, you'd want your test to feature a control group where no worm castings were applied. Make sure that all groups are testing on the same plant species at the same stage of growth in identical conditions. A test like this would take weeks or even months to get results from. But if you've got your own test garden and you can make sure that you can control as much as you can control, you can do what Christy Christie at Black Diamond Vermicompost did and simply show a cabbage grown in castings amended soil next to a cabbage grown without the benefit of worm castings. The results might be pretty stark and it might give you or someone else enough confidence that castings just might work. But I also want to leave you with this word of caution. Positive test of castings on one plant doesn't mean it's ideal for another plant. For instance, a bacterial dominant vermicompost grown in food waste that gives you awesome results on tomatoes might not be as effective on trees and shrubs which want more fungal dominant worm castings. Look, I've been wanting to make this video for a few years because people ask about how to judge quality all the time, whether they're trying to judge our worm castings or someone else's or even their own. The bottom line is that every test has its limitations and just like horseshoes and hand grenades, close matters. Even if you're using bacterial dominant castings on trees, it's still probably better than not using them at all. Now, if you're wondering if we provide test results on our castings, the answer is yes. And you can find both standard compost tests and biological assessments on our product pages for our worm castings and bulk worm castings. Okay, some of you may be new to vermicomposting, but even if you're experienced and wouldn't mind a refresher on a few things, I'd like to send you the Worm Farm Roadmap, AKA your worm bin startup guide. It's a soup to nuts guide for beginners, taking you from the choice of your worm farm all the way to how to best screen and then use your worm castings. Click the link above my left shoulder and you can get that guide right now. All right, gang, I hate to rely on it depends when it comes to the worm castings you've got or quality or not, but it does rely on several different factors. Of the tests that you should expect to get from a quality supplier, I'd expect a biological assessment and maybe a standard compost test. A field test would be awesome, and a microbiome analysis with the DNA sequencing would just be icing on the cake. All right, that's it. We're gonna see you on the next video.